picture a woman vanishing mysteriously from her home, leaving behind a bewildered husband and two young daughters. Her husband, a former rugby star turned teacher, was entangled in a not-so-clandestine affair with one of his students, who moved into his house mere days after his wife's disappearance. Despite the glaringly suspicious circumstances, the police investigation fell short, leaving her disappearance cloaked in mystery. The case went cold for decades until 2018, when a journalist's podcast sparked a renewed wave of interest and brought to light fresh evidence. This is a tale of intrigue, secrets, and an unsolved mystery begging to be solved. This is not a work of fiction. This is the chilling true story of Lynette Dawson, a devoted mother and wife who disappeared from her home in Bayview, a picturesque suburb in Sydney's Northern Beaches region, on January 9, 1982. Christopher and Lynn Dawson, high school sweethearts, attended Sydney Boys High School and Sydney Girls High School respectively. They exchanged vows on March 26, 1970, both at the tender age of 21, eager to embark on a new life journey together. They were graced with two beautiful children and seemed to enjoy a blissful marriage. Christopher Dawson, a man of many talents and undeniable charm, in the 1970s, he was a celebrated rugby player, admired by many. He even dabbled in modeling. After hanging up his rugby boots, he transitioned into teaching at a Sydney high school, working alongside his twin brother. His charismatic personality and striking good looks made him a prominent figure in the community. Lynn, a radiant woman, worked as a nurse at the Worrywood Child Care Center earning high regard from her colleagues and affection from her friends and family, a seemingly idyllic family living an ordinary life. Regrettably, this harmony would be disrupted, and drastically so in 1979, when Christopher began teaching at a Sydney high school alongside his twin brother, Paul Dawson. There, a 16-year-old student named Joanne Curtis caught his attention. He was her physical education teacher. He approached her on the playground, Confessing his attraction to her, his advances and infatuation with her only seemed to intensify over time. In 1980, she accompanied Dawson to a fitness center to help him prepare for the school carnival, and during a moment of rest, he placed his hands on her leg. Joanne Curtis, born on February 11, 1964, was the youngest of three sisters. Her parents divorced in 1977 and her mother remarried shortly after. She found her stepfather to be abusive and controlling. Her mother and stepfather were heavy drinkers and their frequent arguments created a tense atmosphere at home. She found comfort and tranquility in Dawson, who appeared to genuinely care for her, showering her with gifts and affection. Over time, she spent more and more time with him and he invited her to babysit his children. He would leave love notes in her school bag which she would discover after her biology class. She treasured some of these notes for years. Dawson also taught her how to drive in her neighborhood, which helped her secure a driving license. It was clear that this was far from a typical teacher-student relationship. Before long, he was picking her up every Friday night, making a pit stop at a convenience store to buy her chocolates, and then pausing at many point for intimate moments in his car. Their intimate encounters weren't confined to his car. In 1980, they spent New Year's Eve together, sharing intimate moments at his home, at New England University, at his brother Paul Dawson's house, and even at her sister's home. They also had intimate moments at his office or at his own home when Lynn was either asleep or in the shower. He repeatedly proposed to Joanne Curtis, despite still being married to Lynn. On her 17th birthday, he gave her a card that said, quote, the most beautiful girl in the world on her 17th birthday. And on Valentine's Day, he gave her a card that said, quote, the happiness you have given me will be with me forever. She recalls feeling cherished and understood, a stark contrast to her feelings at her troubled home. Her home life was becoming increasingly tumultuous. She found her stepfather's outbursts deeply distressing and tried to avoid all contact by confining herself to her bedroom with the door closed. In late 1981, 
She began living with the Dawsons in exchange for helping to babysit their kids. Lynn's friends cautioned her about this unusual arrangement. However, she chose to trust Christopher Dawson. It was reported that Christopher Dawson began mixing alcoholic beverages for his wife in the evening, and when she would fall asleep, he would have intimate moments with Joanne Curtis in the house. Lynn's suspicions were aroused when she discovered Joanne Curtis swimming topless in her home pool, and Dawson was home, albeit in a different area. Her neighbors and her mother, Helena Sims, had warned her about Joanne Curtis's relationship with Chris, and she knew her marriage was in jeopardy. She was desperate to salvage her marriage. November 1981, Lynn confronted Joanne Curtis at her house when she arrived home from work. Lynn said, quote, you've been taking liberties with my husband. Joanne Curtis understood this to mean that Lynn knew she was having an intimate relationship with her husband. She moved out that very night. Turning point. The year was 1981. Around December 22, Christopher Dawson and Joanne Curtis attempted to elope to Queensland. He was hopeful of starting a new life with her, leaving his young family behind. However, she fell ill and missed her own family. They returned to Sydney on Christmas Day and spent it together. This was the first time he did not spend Christmas with his own family. Joanne told Christopher that she wanted to end their relationship. Christopher did not want that to happen. He had a dominating infatuation with her and was terrified of losing her. After Christopher returned from his trip, Lynn wanted to salvage their marriage, and together they scheduled a marriage counseling appointment. On January 8, 1982, after Lynn returned from a marriage counseling appointment, she had a phone call with her mom, Helena Sims. Helena Sims noted in her diary that Lynn sounded slightly sozzled during the phone call, and she said, quote, my husband's poured me a lovely drink, and everything is just going to be fine. Lynn arranged to meet her mother the following day at North Bridge Baths, where her husband worked as a lifeguard. Disappearance On January 9, 1982, Chris claims he dropped his wife at a Mona Vale bus stop so she could go shopping in the Chatswood suburb. Lynn was expected at the North Bridge bathhouse anytime. However, Lynn failed to show up to meet her mother, husband, and children for their planned family picnic. While waiting, Chris walked away to pick up a phone call. When he returned, he claimed Lynn had just called him and said she needed some more time away to focus on herself. Initially, although taken aback, her mother had no reason to doubt Chris. As the days passed, Lynn's mother and friends grew increasingly worried as Lynn was looking forward to several upcoming events, such as her daughter's first day of school, a birthday she had planned for her mother, and her workplace received no notification of her absence. This was all very uncharacteristic of Lynn. When Dawson was questioned, he always had an update which seemed to alleviate their concerns to some extent, such as, quote, Oh, Lynn's rung me. She needs more time to think. Or she had been spotted at a mall. She didn't doubt him because he was family. Helena documented all these events in her personal diary. Growing suspicion. Eventually, Lynn's family grew very suspicious because Chris seemed to be the only one Lynn was speaking to, and this wasn't like her. Lynn's family, believing that she was out there, went searching for her. Helena Sims reached out to all the nursing hospitals in every state, even New Zealand. She also reached out to all the police in Australia and New Zealand. Her searches bore no fruit. Lynn did not have a passport. There were no signs of her leaving the country. She did not apply for a Medicare card. She was not registered as a nurse anywhere. Unfortunately, they were not able to find the answers they sought. On the other hand, just two days after Lynn vanished, Joan moved into the Dawson's home and assumed the role of woman of the house. Chris would tell his daughters that Lynn was just their pretend mother. Eventually, he married Joanne Curtis in 1984. Lynn's family found out later that Chris had married his high school student with Lynn's wedding ring. This greatly upset Helena, Lynn's siblings, and most of her friends. They also started to grow extremely suspicious of Chris's true intentions and questioned if he had a direct role in Lynn's disappearance. 
Joanne's marriage to Chris wasn't so great. She described herself as the substitute slave, sex slave, housekeeper, stepmother, and babysitter. She did not want to be there. She yearned to be an 18-year-old with her friends. In 1990, despite having a child together, Joanne divorced Chris, and almost immediately she went to the police, raising concerns that she suspected that he had a sinister role in Lynn's disappearance. She also revealed a chilling detail. She had once overheard Christopher Dawson discussing the possibility of hiring a hitman, though he ultimately backed down from this plan. She recalled that Dawson would call his ex-wife Fatso in her presence and sang songs about her unattractiveness. Lynn's colleagues also came forward and mentioned they saw a bruise on Lynn's neck. This was later backed by one of her daughter's statements. Joanne also said on the day of her wedding to Christopher, he put his hands around her neck. A year later, in 1991, Joanne returned to the police to volunteer for additional information. She reflected on her experiences as a student at the school. Some investigations were conducted, but they eventually led nowhere and proved inconclusive. However, this was reported to the state coroner for investigation. Surprisingly, in 2001 and 2003, two coroners concluded that Lynn Dawson was murdered by a known person, very likely to be Christopher Dawson, and made strong recommendations for prosecution. Both times, the director of public prosecution stated there was insufficient evidence to press charges. As the case remained unsolved, in 2015, the New South Wales Police Force's Unsolved Homicide Unit reopened the investigation into Lynn's suspected murder. Fast forward three years, in 2018, a podcast titled The Teacher's Pet focused on this case, re-examining the evidence, motive, and statements from witnesses. It was a smash hit, downloaded 60 million times worldwide. The podcast played a pivotal role in reopening the investigation into Lynn Dawson's disappearance. This reignited the investigation by adding scrutiny and public pressure to resolve a nearly 40-year-old unsolved case. In December 2018, Christopher Dawson was arrested. Both he and his brother Paul were alleged to have regularly engaged in illicit sexual behavior with female students at their respective schools. Chris was further alleged to have been one of six male teachers who preyed on students at Cromer High School. Due to the public notoriety of this case, Dawson's defense team opted for a trial without a jury. In other words, a judge-only trial. For Michael Dawson on the charge that on or about 8 January 1982 at Bayview, uh, you did murder Lynette Dawson. I find you guilty. You may sit down. On August 30, 2022, Dawson, then 74, was found guilty of murdering his wife, Lynn, at the New South Wales Supreme Court. This verdict was considered a shocking precedent at the time by many, as Dawson was convicted without any physical evidence, such as a body, remains, or forensic data to strengthen the prosecution's argument. The judge, Justice Harrison, spent five hours explaining his rationale for declaring Dawson guilty. He discovered that Dawson had lied multiple times, including about his relationship with Joanne Curtis, his intention to rekindle his relationship with his wife, and about receiving calls from Lynn after she vanished. Harrison dismissed the supposed sightings of Lynn as completely unreliable and found an extremely persuasive collection of evidence to refute the idea that Lynn Dawson simply left her family. He was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Lynn Dawson's death was the result of a deliberate and voluntary act by Chris Dawson. This case would have remained unsolved if not for the groundbreaking work of a journalist and his podcast. The Teacher's Pet, released in May 2018, exposed the flaws and failures of the original police investigation and uncovered new evidence and witnesses that pointed to Christopher Dawson's guilt. The podcast unveiled the shocking extent of the sexual abuse and exploitation that transpired at Cromer High School, implicating Chris, his twin brother Paul, and other teachers. The podcast ignited a public outcry and a media storm, pressuring the authorities to persist with the investigation and deliver justice for Lynn. The podcast encountered several challenges and controversies along its journey. 
It was threatened legally by Christopher Dawson's lawyers, who argued that it was prejudicial and defamatory. It also faced scrutiny from certain media outlets and experts who questioned its accuracy, ethics, and impact on the trial. Due to a court order prohibiting any further publication of material that could influence the jury, the podcast had to cease production and remove some episodes from its website. Following the verdict, Christopher Dawson was sentenced to 24 years in prison with a non-parole period of 18 years. He continues to maintain his innocence and has filed paperwork for an appeal. He is currently serving his sentence at Long Bay Correctional Center. The media played a crucial role in bringing Christopher Dawson's crimes to justice. However, on the other hand, Netflix's American Nightmare critiques modern-day policing. It highlights the police's refusal to believe a woman's abduction was real, influenced by Hollywood movies such as Gone Girl and the American media presenting speculative narratives at best, instead of investigative journalism. In both cases, the media shaped public opinion and influenced the trials. But the outcomes were starkly different, demonstrating that the media can both aid and hinder the pursuit of justice. Thank you for joining us on this journey through one of Australia's most infamous cold cases. We hope this series has provided you with some insight into the complexities of criminal investigations and the pursuit of justice. We would love to hear your thoughts on this case. Please share them in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this series, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications on future episodes. Until next time, stay curious, stay vigilant, and always seek the truth.